Let us then return to that portion of Scripture that we read earlier from Luke's Gospel, chapter 22. We're going to focus on these verses 39 to 53. And our text, if we wish to have a text to isolate our thoughts, would be verse 53 itself. So, Luke chapter 22, verse 53, for our text, with the words of the Lord Jesus, that he said to the chief priests and the captains of the temple, When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Particularly these last words. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. The title for the sermon tonight, The Appointed Hour. The Appointed Hour. Solomon, in the book of Ecclesiastes, in the Old Testament, writing at that time as the wisest man in the world. What does he say in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1? To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. The words that the Lord Jesus Christ here spoke in our text, he said it to those who were his enemies, who were, if we might use this expression, his outward, tangible enemies that could be clearly seen. Ultimately, we know what was behind these persons, for the Bible teaches us we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We know who was ultimately behind these people. It was the evil one. And here the Lord Jesus says to them and says to the evil one, this is your hour and the power of darkness. This was the time when they were going to arrest him. And this is the time when he would be tried unfairly and he would be condemned to crucifixion. And the Lord Jesus was able to say calmly to them, this is your hour and the power of darkness. It was the hour that had been determined where Christ's enemies would do all that had been determined to be done. This was the hour. And when we use the term, your hour, we don't simply mean to confine it to a 60-minute period of time. When it talks about this is your hour, he's really saying this is the time, the season, the appropriate time, the time that's been set by heaven itself in order that these wicked men might ultimately carry out what they sought to do to crucify Christ. This is your hour and the power of darkness. We want to look at this then in context. We want to derive one or two practical lessons from this passage for us. This was the hour of darkness. This was a time of their power and of their opportunity. But we are not to think for one moment that it was not the hour for the Lord Jesus also. What do I mean? Well, earlier in this incident or this period of time, earlier in John's Gospel, when the Greeks came and they said to the disciples, we want to see Jesus. It was the time of the Passover 
the great feast of the Passover, and they came because they had heard about Jesus. And they go to the disciples, Sirs, we want to see Jesus. And when Jesus heard that, this is what he said. Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. So, when the Lord Jesus said to these evil persons here, This is your hour, it was also the hour of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have two opposing influences here. We have an evil influence, and it was their time. It was the time that had been determined from all eternity. But it was also the time when the hour would come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And therefore, we want to ask ourselves, and we want to look into this passage and to see how the Lord Jesus coped in that hour. How did he manage? What did he do? What was his reaction? Well, we find it in the passage that we, read, we have read here. This was a terrible time for the Lord Jesus. We know that Christ is God in the flesh. He is Almighty God, but he's also man. He is perfect God and perfect man. And here, friends, we see the perfect man, how he is to face this daunting trial that was to come upon him. What do we find first of all then? We have here before us in these verses, we have an example of how we are to deal with trials and tribulations and difficulties that will come upon us. We are to follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 40, for instance, And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them, about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed. We know from gathering from other gospel records, we know that he took his disciples with him to the Garden of Gethsemane. And then we know when they all got there, he took three of his innermost disciples. He took Peter, James, and John to be with him. And he left the other ones somewhat nearer the entrance to the garden. And he took Peter and James and John and went further into the garden. And then he came to some spot and he left them and went further. But what are we meant to derive from this? We're meant to derive that when this trouble was coming upon the Lord Jesus, when the powers of hell were upon him, when his soul was in anguish, what do we find him doing? We find him praying. It's simple, is it not? But friends, it is not so simple to put these things into practice as we know from our own experience. We are not going to go through anything like what the Lord Jesus Christ went through. We're not going to say that for one moment. But nevertheless, as the people of God, what will happen? We will get trials and difficulties and problems and disappointments. How are we going to handle them? Very often, we do the exact opposite to what Christ did here. Prayer was his first resort. Do we not hold our hands up and say, very often for us, prayer is our last resort. The Psalms teach us this. Psalm 50 verse 15, for instance, says, <coughs> Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Do we call upon the name of the Lord in the days of trouble? This is what we should do. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ did. Again, the Psalms, Psalm 56, verse 3, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. <coughs> do we get times when we're afraid? Of course we do. Does our faith fail us sometimes? Of course it does. What are we to do? Here's the answer. We are to find ourselves in prayer. We are to go on our knees. We are to call upon the living God. 
James tells us exactly the same in the, Old Te in the New Testament. Is any among you afflicted? Are there any among us afflicted today? Well, there will be, or there shall be, because we cannot go through this Christian life unless we be afflicted. It comes with the territory. We cannot avoid it. What does James say? Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. This is the example of the Savior. Let him pray. Oh, but you might say, well, God knows everything. Why do I need to pray? Friends, this is what God has ordained. This is the way to deal with these things. We're not to question why God tells us to do these things. We are to be obedient. We are to open our hearts up. We are to make clear our problems. We are to unburden our souls upon the living God. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. And here was the Lord Jesus Christ facing all the enemies of darkness. Terrible, terrible time was about to come upon him. And he cries out to the living God in prayer. But we would also notice, friends, something else. His prayer was particular. And there was one thing that singled out his prayer, if you like. We do believe at this time, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, it is becoming clear to him what is lying ahead of him. As God, he knew everything, of course. But as far as, as his humanity was concerned, it was becoming clear to him what lay ahead of him. He was going to sweat great drops of blood. He was in anguish and agony. And what brought this about? Well, he knew what lay ahead of him. And this is what caused him to pray. But at the end, this is what characterized his prayer. It was a prayer of submission. Verse 42, for instance, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. This tells us about the humanity of the Lord Jesus. Perfect humanity. He was going to face death. He didn't want to face death. No human wants to face death. It is against our nature to die. And here he's clearly revealing that he is fully man. If thou be willing, remove this cup from me. But he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. What's he saying here? Well, he is saying, if there's no way out, I will submit to the will of the Father. I will accept his will. He recognizes that God's will is ultimately better. And it's right and fit and proper. He recognizes then, if there's no way out, then he is prepared to submit himself to the will of God. We have to bear in mind and keep this before us at all times. The Lord Jesus had a, a human will and a divine will. We're talking here about his human will. We're not talking about his divine will. His divine will was always one with the Father's will. These things will stretch us. These things will cause us to ponder and think as they should. But what we want to learn from here is he didn't pray in a general manner. He prayed that he was willing to be submissive to the will of God. I know Christians, if you're serious at all about your faith, you want to look for 
marks of grace. You want to see some evidence of the, the work of God in your soul. You want to see some evidence that truly you're a Christian. Well, here is one sign. Here is one evidence to suggest that truly a work of grace has begun in you. Are you prepared to suffer? Are you prepared to submit to the will of God? We all want an easy life. Is that not true? None of us wants difficulties. We'd like, we would, would recoil from them. But they will come our way. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. A Christian who is suffering. A Christian who is suffering against his own will, which is contrary to flesh and blood, who is prepared to accept that, is truly a mark of grace. This is what marked his prayer. He had strong cries, pleadings, but ultimately he said, not my will, but thine be done. What else can we notice here from these verses? Well, surely when we look at Christ at Gethsemane, and as we've mentioned before that he was in agony, verse 44 tells us, in an agony he prayed more earnestly. What indeed caused the Lord Jesus Christ to sweat great drops of blood and to be in an agony? Now some people would say that it was because he did not want to die. Well, that is true. That is true, but that's not the real reason. That's not the real reason here whatsoever. Look at verse 39, for instance. And he came out and went, as he was wont, to the Mount of Olives. He left the upper room with his disciples. Where did he go? He went to the Mount of Olives, where he would normally retire to at night. What does this teach us? Well, it teaches us that he went to the very place where he knew that Judas knew where he went to. And therefore, Judas would be able to take the chief priests and the captains of the temple right to the very place where Jesus was. And therefore, when he left the upper room, he did not seek to hide. He did not seek to avoid Judas and the confrontation that came. He went to that place where he knew Judas would take the chief priests and the captains of the temple. And therefore, it is not sufficient to say that he wanted to avoid death. What then caused this great sweating of blood? It was the fact that he was to be made a sacrifice for sin. The sins of his people were laid upon him. It was the guilt and the sinfulness of sin as it was being laid upon our scapegoat as it was being laid upon our Passover lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, as that bared upon his soul, that is what caused him to sweat great drops of blood. And friends, what we're meant to realize here is the terribleness and the sinfulness and the guilt of sin. Too many people laugh at sin. The world laughs at sin. The world gloats in sin. We live in a time when people take pride in their sin. Oh, if only we knew what it was like. Here the Holy Lamb of God, Jesus Christ himself, was taking upon himself our sin. And because of that, he sweat great drops of blood. It fell from his face to the ground. He was in agony over this matter. Oh, friends, is there not a warning, therefore? Is there not a warning to us all? It's a warning to the unbeliever. What a terrible thing it is to 
be guilty of sin and not to have our sins forgiven and not to be reconciled to God. What a terrible thing it is to stand before God in eternity. Still in a state of nature and your sins are not forgiven. Then you'll know something about the terribleness of sin. Then you'll know something about the, the sinfulness of sin. Then you'll know something about standing before a thrice holy God guilty of sin. Sin in your nature, sin in practice. At this moment it might not bother you. But one day it will. Unless it's dealt with. And blessed be God for the Christian who has Christ as his Lord and Savior. That there, Christ at Gethsemane and of course at Calvary, he dealt with the problem of sin. He was punished in the room and place of sinners. He was condemned. He was crucified in order that his people might be set free. And this should cause the Christian indeed to rejoice. Oh, rejoice, Christian. You have a Savior who has dealt with every single sin. You are wiped clean. You are pure and holy. You stand in the righteousness of Christ himself. Because he was punished in your room and in your place. That's why he was in an agony. He was willing to go to death. He was willing to undergo that horrible crucifixion. Suffering not just physically, mentally, but spiritually. But we do see the exceeding guilt and the sinfulness of sin. We also see something else surely from this, these words here, these verses that we find. Do we not see fourthly the feebleness of the best of saints? Here we have who, are with, who is with the Lord Jesus. Well, we have the inner circle, as we said, but it's not mentioned here. We draw it from other gospel records. We know that Peter, James and John were with them. He goes back to them after he's had a bout of prayer. He goes back to them. And what do we find? They're asleep. They're asleep. Verse 45. When he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. Who were they? Peter, James, John, the very pillars, the very foundations of the Christian church, they were going to be the ones who were going to take the gospel to the ends of the earth as far as it was possible in their day and generation. But here, when Jesus told them to pray, they were asleep. It's interesting to note and Someone pointed this out to me that when Jesus took them into the Garden of Gethsemane and he himself went off to pray, he did not ask them to pray for him. Some people might think that's why he took them. No, he didn't take them in order that they might pray for him. They were told to pray for themselves to keep them from temptation. Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Well, we've said it on many occasions. We are not here to scold uh, the disciples or the apostles. No, rather, we look at the disciples and the apostles, and what do we see in them? We see in ourselves. Do we not realize our own feebleness? Do we not recognize that when we're called upon to pray, as we are, I don't mean in public like this, but in our closets, do we not find that very often when we come to pray, very often our minds wander. We're not as sharp, we're not as focused, we're not as zealous as we should be. We are like the 
apostles here, we sleep on when we should be praying earnestly, when we should be calling out to the living God that he might strengthen us, that he might encourage us, and that he might make us useful vessels in his kingdom. And we fail to pray as we should, lest ye enter into temptation. Well, we could move on and we could draw another thought from these verses. We find here that some people are more inclined to fight for Christ than suffer for Christ. What do I mean? Well, <clears throat> what do we have here? We have in verse 50. And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Again, drawing from other gospel records, we know that this person was Peter. Brave brass Peter. And the servant's name was Malchus. And Peter there with a sword. That itself was not unusual. The people of that day would normally carry some kind of weapon to defend themselves. Not so much against ordinary people, but against thieves or against wild animals. So the fact that Peter had a sword was not unusual. But here we have him with his master, with the disciples. And he sees his master about to be taken. And he defends his master. He's prepared to fight for his master. But as you know, as we have read, it was only a few minutes later on that he denied his master. And there's a lesson there for every one of us. The lesson is we can be more inclined to be active for Christ than passive for Christ. We can be more concerned about active graces than passive graces. What do I mean? Well, we can be ones who are concerned to do, to be active, to be out and to be about, and to take the cause of Christ with us. When sometimes, friends, it would be better if we were passive. Sometimes we think that those who are active, the activists, are the real Christians. And they're the ones that are making the difference. You could think maybe of, of ministers. They're always out at front. They're in the public gaze and they're doing the preaching and the teaching. And you might say to yourself, well, there's an active minister. He's out and about. He must be a great Christian. Or it may be said of, about an, an office bearer or a private Christian who's out and about and always active in the cause of Christ. Active in the church, active in this committee or that committee. But sometimes, friends, the persons who do most good for the cause of Christ may well be extremely passive and they're not able to do much at all. Peter didn't in any sense bring glory to himself by this action. He brought far more glory to himself and advanced far more, we might say, the cause of Christ when he stood before the council and said, we're going to obey God rather than man. And sometimes the Christian who cannot be active through infirmity or old age. And he may lie in his bed and he's not able to move, but he's able to endure the sufferings that he does because of his interest in Christ. And maybe that person who's never seen, but whose prayers are offered up day after day to the throne of grace, suffering because he's a Christian, 
further advances the cause of Christ than the most outwardly active Christian that we know. Never despise those who seem to be the least inactive. They maybe cannot do things, but what they do brings glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we find here. Peter with his sword, I'll sort it out. I'll defend my master. A few minutes later, he denied him when a maid said, a woman, a young woman said, thou wast with Jesus of Nazareth. And he denied him. Well, for him, finally, friends, for our comfort, we want to <coughs> look <coughs> and acknowledge that evil will have its hour. Evil will have its time on the stage, if you like. It will have its day. When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Here he was. He was going to be taken by the chief priests and the captains of the temple. He surrendered to them. He was daily in the temple before this. They couldn't touch him. They could not touch him. It was impossible for them to lay a hand upon the Lord Jesus Christ. They wanted to do away with Christ earlier on in his public ministry. You can read the Gospels, you'll find it. They couldn't do it. We know that well-meaning people wanted to make him a king early on in his public ministry. They couldn't do it. The time wasn't at hand. We know, too, that they wanted to do away with him, avoiding the Passover. At the time of the Passover, Jerusalem was thronging with visitors. And the chief priests and the enemies of Christ, they wanted to destroy him. But they said, not on the feast day. In Matthew, for instance, chapter 26, it, it speaks of this. And it talks about their consulting one another. Consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. We're going to kill him, but not on the feast day. What did God say? You're going to kill him, but it will be on the feast day. It will be the day that I have determined. Because evil will have its day. It will have its opportunity. But we are meant to realize that evil is fixed. It is fixed. And it cannot happen without the living God. It will have its hour. And this was evil's hour. This is your hour and the power of darkness. We see it in uh, the life of Job. Satan could not touch Job until God gave the go-ahead. And when the time came to bring about the restoration of, of Job, Satan could do nothing to stop it. It is fixed. This is what we find here. And therefore, the Lord Jesus was able to resign himself unto his enemies knowing that the time had come. Now this is true in every age 
that we find ourselves in. Therefore, what are we to do? We are not to panic. We might say to ourselves, we might think to ourselves, and we cannot be dogmatic over this, but we might say to ourselves that we're in a time that this is evil's hour. The church is not what it should be. Times are difficult. It's not a time to panic. It's not a time to despair. This is your hour and the power of darkness. But there will be a change. It is fixed, but it is limited. Satan and his forces are in chains. Never forget it. They are in chains. And maybe this is Satan's hour for a moment. This calls for faith. This calls for a realization that no matter what might befall us, it's only for an hour. It is limited. It is fixed. Satan, the enemies, they thought that they had him. We know ultimately they went to the, he went to the cross. He died. That was their hour. They did all that they could to him. But then the resurrection. Then the first day of the week. Then the tomb was opened. Then he arose. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. This was their hour and the power of darkness. But it was overcome. Christ overcame. And he faced his darkest hour with the forces of darkness, knowing that ultimately he would triumph. And this must be what we must take with us as we go through this life. Evil, it's fixed, it's limited. Satan is but a, a servant who is chained and bound and can do nothing to the people of God or to the cause of Christ without the permission of of Almighty God. The appointed hour. And may the Lord bless his word to us.